system that it has. I can't tell them. There we go. That's confirmation I was looking for. All right. So my name is Doug Patton. I am um, a general surgeon by training. I serve as the uh, associate dean for the Southwest Campus of the Medical College of Georgia. Uh, and I'm part of the hub team here at the Georgia Colorectal Cancer Control Program, uh, Project ECHO. Um, it's important for us to, uh, as best we can, to keep our uh, screens on and keep our cameras on so we can see faces. This is how we get to know each other. Uh, and literally, as this project has continued to roll along, we've had um, uh, participants from multiple states, uh, and it's kind of nice for us to be able to see. So if you can, if your bandwidth will allow it, please turn on your camera and leave it on throughout the meeting. If you need to turn it off, we understand. Um, let's see, as I mentioned earlier, please put your name, your organization, and your email address in the chat, if you don't mind. That way we can keep up with who all is participating. Um, and uh, I'll, at this point, uh, we'll move to the agenda, just a high view of the agenda. So we're doing the introduction now. Uh, we'll have uh, Dr. Smitha Krishnamurti, uh, who will uh, provide a didactic session for us, and we'll go to a case presentation. Uh, by Dr. Desai and also by uh, one of the uh, navigators from Horizons will join us at that point. Um, and then, of course, at the end, we'll do some wrap up and discussion and question and answer uh, for everyone. Uh, I meant to say Aisha Viquez from um, uh, Horizons will be joining Dr. Desai for that presentation. Also, we have Dr. Santolano and Dr. Ibrahim. Uh, managing the controls today. We also have Chris Tucker, who's uh, looking after things. Any questions at all that come up, uh, you can uh, type those into the chat, um, and we'll be monitoring that, and we can look to see if there are issues or concerns. All right, so just moving along, a few quick things, reminders about Project ECHO. Uh, this is Moving Knowledge Instead of People, and ECHO stands for Extension for Community Healthcare Outcomes. Next slide, please. Um, this is for the colorectal cancer screening component of this, our, our mission is to make sure that we're providing education uh, for quality improvement purposes. And these sessions will be recorded so that we can access them later and learn from them, uh, review and things like that. Um, you are considering to be recorded by participating as we mentioned earlier. And because this is not a secure connection, uh, please do not mention PHI in the discussions. If you have questions um, at the end of the presentations, you can email at au underscore CRC screening at augusta.edu, or you can put it in the chat. We'll be watching that. Again, um, data, uh, we do collect data that begins with registration, but it's collected throughout, including things that are entered in the chat, the recordings themselves, um, questions and any poll responses and survey uh, questions. Speaking of that, there'll be a survey that was, there was a QR code for it up uh, initially. There'll be, you'll see that QR code again for a very, very important survey with a bonus uh, for participation. So uh, hang in there with us and um, please be prepared to give us your feedback on that. Uh, general Zoom rules, mute uh, when you're not speaking, unmute when you do speak, leave your cameras on if possible, type questions in the chat screen, there's an electronic hand icon if you need to get our attention more urgently than a question in the chat. Certainly when we get to open question and answer time, the raise hand button, uh, we will be um, savvy to looking out for those. And, and when we do acknowledge you, please introduce yourself by your name and your clinic uh, when you do speak. Uh, again, we've talked about the camera. The suggestion is to use the gallery view so you can see as many people as possible. Uh, and remember to put notes in the chat if you're having technical problems. Next slide, please. All right. So with that, um, it's my privilege at this point to introduce our guest uh, presenter. And this is Dr. Smitha Krishnamurthy. Uh, she is a medical oncologist specializing in the care of patients with gastrointestinal cancer. She's a staff physician in the Department of Hematology and Oncology at the Cleveland Clinic. And she serves as an associate professor of medicine at the Cleveland Clinic Learner College of Medicine at Case Western Reserve University. She completed her fellowship in medical oncology at Johns Hopkins University after completing residency in medical school at the University of Pennsylvania. She is a member of the Colorado Cancer Committee on National Comprehensive Cancer Networks. She is also a member of the Society for Immunotherapy of Cancer, Gastrointestinal Cancer's Immunotherapy Guideline Expert Panel. 
That's a mouthful. She has served as the medical director of the clinical research office of the Case Comprehensive Cancer Center and led their committee on disparities in clinical research for 10 years. She enjoys partnering with patient advocacy groups to raise awareness about early onset colorectal cancer. Her talk today will be on young onset colorectal cancer, the clinical aspects. We've allotted about 20 minutes for this time. She finishes early, we'll have a little time for questions. If not, we'll save the questions. Please put them in the chat and then we'll get to them towards the end. Um, with that, um, Dr. Kristen Murphy, thank you for joining us today. We welcome you to our Colorectal Cancer Project ECHO, and we're going to turn it over to you at this point. Thank you so much, Dr. Patton, for that kind introduction, and thank you, Dr. Desai, for the invitation. I am so honored to be here and really relish the chance to talk about this entity. I'm, I'm a medical oncologist, so I'm seeing patients who've been diagnosed with typically stage two, three, and four. Uh, colorectal cancer. And so I, I love any chance I can get to raise awareness about it. And I, I think the efforts of all of you participating in this group are just uh, so commendable um, and uh, so pleased to be part of it today. So I'm going to be talking about this young onset colorectal cancer. Uh, you know, as you know, a lot of our literature also calls it early onset colorectal cancer, but in oncology, at least we're moving towards this uh, YOCRC name, and I'm going to focus on the clinical aspects. Next slide, please. And what I'm hoping uh, will, will come out of today's talk is increase awareness of the rising incidence of young onset colorectal cancer and increasing awareness of the presentation of this disease and an understanding of the impact of the diagnosis on our patients. Next slide, please. So I wanted to start off with a case, a patient of mine who um, was a 46, very fit, actually like a bodybuilder. And he happened to have heard from his father that he'd, the father had had a colonoscopy and had an advanced adenoma. And uh, you know, a lot of families don't talk about this, but they did. And so the patient knew that he would be at increased risk of colon cancer because of this. And so he requested a colonoscopy, a screening colonoscopy. Um, and this was before the guidelines had changed to screening at age 45. And his colonoscopy showed that he had rectal cancer and staging revealed it had already spread to um, four or more lymph nodes. It was stage uh, 3B uh, already, a uh, curable, but still like, you know, regional disease. Like many of our young patients, he had no germline mutation. And he embarked on the treatment, which I'll touch on a little bit later, which was chemo radiation, followed by four months of chemotherapy. And uh, he fortunately had a complete clinical response. So we're doing active surveillance and seeing if he can avoid surgery. But uh, you know, things could have been so much worse if he had not asked for that colonoscopy, if he didn't know his family history. Next slide, please. And so here we're looking at, um, among multiple countries around the world, uh, what's happening with this um, early onset or young onset colorectal cancer. And I should have said that what I mean by this is colorectal cancer diagnosed in individuals younger than age 50. And um, it really refers to people who are born 1960 and later. Uh, that's where we're seeing the rising trend. And we're seeing here, the red bars are indicating that there's been an increase in incidence uh, gray is where it's uh, not significantly different, and blue bars are countries that had a significant decrease, which are very few. It's Italy and Lithuania and Austria, but USA is the third country on the list here. We're following South Korea and Australia, but it's really um, across mostly high-income countries around the world, so places with disparate diets and you know different regions, so um, it's a worldwide phenomenon, and we don't know the cause. Next slide, please. And here we're looking at uh, colorectal cancer in between 2015, 2019, and broken down by the um, rates per 100,000 population by different age categories along the x-axis. And so uh, really the early onset, young onset is what's focused in this red circle. And most of young onset colorectal cancer, you know, the, the biggest category I should say is uh, in the patients ages 45 to 49. That's where 43% of this is occurring. And it's estimated that by the end of this decade, by 2030, 
uh, colorectal cancer will be the leading cause of cancer death among individuals ages 20 to 49. So that's just you know shocking to me. Um, next slide, please. And here we're looking at trends in colorectal cancer um, incidence by age and tumor site. So like top left is all ages and the purple line is proximal colon cancers, green distal, orange is rectum and the, the gray is large intestine not otherwise specified. So among all, all ages overall, the rates as you know, over this 20 year period are going down but we're seeing a plateau in rectal cancer among going now to the bottom, right, 65 years and above, um, who are having their screening colonoscopies, the incidence is decreasing for proximal colon cancer, uh, which is, you know, most common in this age group, decreasing for distal, but even here, we're seeing a plateau in rectal cancer. And then when you look at this uh, top right box, ages 20 to 49, you know, the lines are going up, particularly for rectal cancer and distal colon cancer. So this Young onset colorectal cancer really seems to be affecting the left side of the colon and the rectum. Next, uh, next slide, please. And here again, more data from the American Cancer Society, uh, incidents and trends by age and stage. So um, the black line, sorry, let me start up. The yeah, black line is localized, red line regional, so spread to lymph nodes, blue is metastatic, and the pink is unstaged. So among all ages, uh, with screening colonoscopies, there's been a decrease in um, localized regional cancer, a um, little decrease in metastatic disease. And most of the benefit are in the patients in the lower um, right box, 65 years and above. Uh, but when you look at 20 to 49 years in the top right box, uh, you know, this is really sad. These lines are just going up for um, localized in black, regional in red, and metastatic disease because, of course, these people are not getting um, screening colonoscopies. Next slide, please. Um, sorry about the animation. Next. Okay, there we go. So this, um, this uh, paper is just such a tour de force, really trying to look at all the exposures that could be causing um, young onset colorectal cancer. And, you know, really what they, the elements that lead to um, something being on this list or that, well, the, the factor has to be worldwide because this is a worldwide phenomenon, has to be temporally related to this trend. So like there's an increase in this exposure after the 1960s and that the exposure should lead to some inflammation in the gut or microbiome, it's thought. And so Looking here, they're showing a whole, and it has to be something that starts early. I forgot to say that. That was the fourth criteria because we're seeing this increased incidence even in individuals like in their 20s. So this must be something that's even affecting people in their teenage years, maybe even earlier than that. And so um, all sorts of things are on this list. Uh, early life exposures, like even breastfeeding, what type of formula was used, cesarean versus vaginal delivery. Um, I, I saw there was recently a paper just this year looking in Sweden, um, looking at incidence of young onset colorectal cancer uh, by um, cesarean or um, vaginal delivery and found an increased incidence in women uh, who had been born by a cesarean section. It's thought that that leads to some uh, reduction in the diversity of the gut microbiome of the baby. I mean, I think just fascinating, completely, you know, not my usual um, uh, way I spend my time thinking, but uh, all of this is so fascinating to me. Uh, psychological stress, for example, in the mother could lead to methylation changes in the developing baby. Um, uh, of course, genetics, uh, you know, inherited mutations, antibiotics, uh, of course, can affect the gut microbiome and antibiotic use for like, for example, childhood ear infections really increased in the 1980s compared to earlier decades. Um, but uh, then in terms of like uh, other exposomal elements um, that are not just early life exposures, and exposomal refers to all the exposures we have, um, anything that's not inherited, uh, we know probably the strongest um, links are with the Western diet. So um, a lot of processed foods, high in red meat, sugary beverages, um, cooking practices, even as you, you all know, are familiar with the risks of colon cancer, like 
charboiled meats have increased carcinogens. Um, I was surprised to learn synthetic dyes, um, MSG, uh, titanium dioxide is like a whitening agent used in foods like white frosting. And of course, high fructose corn syrup really took off use in the 1980s. Um, and so these, uh, uh, all these exposures could affect our microbiome, but we really don't know what's the cause. And so, so much work is being done to try to unravel this mystery. Next slide, please. And so my second case here, um, again, based on a, a patient I see, she's 45 um, when we met, she'd had iron deficiency anemia for four years and she was known to have this. And you know her doctor thought this is from her periods, which were a little heavy, although not anything extreme. Then she developed constipation, um, which was new and it persisted for like two years. And finally, um, she had been asking for colonoscopy and it was not thought to be necessary. And then when the screening guidelines changed to allow at age 45, she requested, she got it. She had an obstructing sigmoid cancer. And this is her CT scan. She had um, lots of metastases to her liver. And like many of our patients, um, like my first case as well, no inherited cause found. Next slide, please. And I feel like she exemplifies um, what we hear a lot from our patients um, that, of course, you know, they may not have recognized symptoms, but the providers also, because this is a rather new entity. And I'm sharing data here from a survey of colorectal cancer survivors uh, put out by the Colorectal Cancer Alliance. So it has all the caveats of the survey. Uh, it all totally depends on who you're asking. So these are um, mostly women, mostly white, mostly from the US, um, and mostly diagnosed in their 40s. And of course, these are patients who really wanted to answer the survey. We don't know how many people didn't have a bad experience and didn't want to answer, but these patients reported that 81% uh, of them had at least three symptoms. And the symptoms are listed here. Um, most commonly was blood in the stool. It's actually listed twice, blood in the stool and rectal bleeding. Um, abdominal pain, fatigue, constipation. Um, and then on the next slide, please. So they, you know, these patients who answered the survey, um, how long did they have the symptoms before going to the doctor uh, in navy blue here? Most of them less than three months. That was the biggest category. But, you know, you see light blue, six to 12 months, and even like some who reported more than two years. The middle figure, how long did it take to be diagnosed once you sought medical attention? And 45% you know, were within one month, um, which is terrific. But then you do have this like 19% more than 12 months. And then the last figure here, mistakenly diagnosed conditions, not surprisingly, rectal bleeding, you know, frequently attributed to hemorrhoids, um, irritable bowel, even mental health issues. Um, next slide, please. This was perhaps a little bit more objective. This was a large study recently published looking at uh, insurance database, looking at claims for symptoms and then claims for the diagnosis um, with uh, over 5,000 cases and over 20,000 matched controls. And they found that 19% of patients with young onset colorectal cancer had a symptom uh, at least three months before diagnosis. And the, the red flag symptoms they identified were abdominal pain, rectal bleeding, that was the strongest uh, association, diarrhea, iron deficiency, anemia. Next slide, please. They showed that if you if the patient had like, that's in this blue bar here under one symptom, if you had one symptom, the median time to diagnosis was 9.7 months, two symptoms, and it was down to 5.8 months. And with three or more symptoms, it was down to 4.8 months. Um, so it just kind of shows the importance of being aware of these symptoms. Next slide, please. And then I think this is my last case. Uh, young woman, only early 30s, was pregnant, uh, developed rectal bleeding in her second trimester. And, you know, quite commonly, this would be due to hemorrhoids. Um, and she presented to the ED with left lower quadrant pain at 33 weeks. And because of the pregnancy, you know, the, the imaging was limited. She had a pelvic ultrasound, which was interpreted as normal. She delivered a healthy baby of one month later. And then soon after that was admitted with sepsis. Um, CT scan looked like she had a tubo ovarian abscess. It also noted sigmoid colon thickening and multiple liver densities. But like in this young, otherwise healthy person, this was thought to most likely these were liver abscesses. Next slide, please. So 
she underwent like drainage of the abscess, antibiotics, follow-up CT, showing decrease in the pelvic fluid, but increasing liver lesions. Six weeks after the delivery, she has a colonoscopy that shows a sigmoid colon cancer, ultimately has biopsies found to have metastatic disease to her liver or peritoneum, like incurable cancer, no germline mutation in this young lady patient as well. So it's just heartbreaking, these cases, and we feel so helpless being on the end of, you know, treating them. So like really appreciate the chance to raise awareness about this. Next slide, please. Um, so, you know, just this, now we're going to move into like the little bit about treatment. Um, so Memorial Sloan Kettering has published their institutional data of their young onset patients versus average onset patients. They looked at genomics, germline alterations, and response to treatment. And in this like lower left box, just it's too small to see, but basically the very left is this very young patients, 14 to 35 years. Then in the middle is early onset. And then you have eight patients, 50 and older, no difference in the genomic differences. So look, no difference in like KRAS gene mutations um, or P53 mutations um, found. They looked at then germline alterations. And of course, not surprisingly, the younger the patient is, the higher risk that they have an inherited mutation. So among, that's in this middle bar, um, 14 to 35 years of age, 23% of the patients had a germline mutation. And 36 to 49 years old, it was about 15%. Similar findings in the Ohio Cancer Consortium where they found 16% of people diagnosed below age 50 had a germline mutation. Then looking at these like gray, black, and um, uh, green bars, uh, they're looking at response. So like the response, any response is shown in green among the very young, 36 to 49 and 50 and above. And there's really no difference in how they responded to chemotherapy when they have metastatic disease. And then the curves are showing the survival um, um, in terms of months from metastases and really no difference there. The median survival here is like really close to five years. And I think that's reflecting the memorial population. People are coming to them for aggressive surgery for oligometastatic disease. But among all comers with metastatic disease, the median survival is 30 to 36 months, uh, sadly, um, even with the treatments we have now. Next slide, please. And our work here, um, one of our fellows looked at our database of patients with young onset rectal cancer and found that uh, our pa these patients have increased incidence of nausea with chemotherapy compared to older patients. This has been shown with adjuvant chemotherapy at, for colon cancer and metastatic disease as well. And we looked at our patients getting total neoadjuvant therapy. So rad chemo radiation followed by chemo and then surgery or non-operative management if they had a complete clinical response. And um, the um, we found that the young patients had significantly more nausea compared to average onset with the chemo radiation and with consolidation chemotherapy. Next slide, please. One bit of good news for young patients diagnosed with rectal cancer, you, this, you might've heard of this study, got a lot of publicity, it was published in the New England Journal of Medicine and New York Times on the same day. Small study patients with mismatch repair deficient rectal cancer. So most of these patients have Lynch syndrome. Um, which is far more common to have mismatch repair deficiency in the right colon. But in this study, Andrea Sursek and colleagues at Memorial Sloan Kettering treated these patients with immunotherapy upfront instead of chemo radiation or chemotherapy. And um, this colorful graph here is showing that among the 12 patients in the study, 100% of them had a complete disappearance of their um, tumor with immunotherapy. Um, six months of treatment. And similar study in the Netherlands, these are the red bars shown um, in this figure. Uh, these patients also had deficient mismatch repair, colon cancer, and were given just two doses of immunotherapy. And then they all went to surgery and almost 100% had a complete pathologic response. So immunotherapy works very well for patients with deficient mismatch repair, um, which is what Lynch syndrome cancers are. And that of course, more likely in our young patients. Next slide, please. And so just wanted to finish up with the quality of life for patients with young onset colorectal cancer, starting with this beautiful picture of Lisa Johnson. I had the pleasure of meeting her. She's um, a member of the Colon Club. And you know she puts this picture out. And I just think it just exemplifies the strength and resilience of our patients um, who you know live their life despite getting this diagnosis at such a young age. Treatment of rectal cancer is 
is pretty toxic. We start with chemo radiation to minimize the risk of local recurrence, then chemotherapy. And then if the patient has residual tumor, they go to total mesorectal excision for curative intent or watch and wait, or we can call it active surveillance uh, if they've had a complete clinical response. And, you know, severe toxicity occurs in almost half the patients. Over 40% will have low anterior resection syndrome. So they never go back to normal bowel pattern. They're, they're always struggling with um, erratic bowel pattern. And they report worse quality of life scores compared to older patients in terms of like sexual function, body image, finances. Of course, this is striking young people during their working years, their school years, social family impact and emotional distress. Next slide, please. Um, this uh, was just a, a, from a, a paper from Memorial Sloan Kettering about a guidelines for how to manage these patients. So, um, uh, in, so basically, uh, early attention to symptoms, early workup, um, treatment can be similar to what we do for our average onset patients. We don't know that they need any different treatment. Of course, we want genetic testing for all of the patients. And then we have to address the psychosocial needs. Um, recognize like that fertility preservation is an issue in this group and you know send them for that counseling before we begin our treatments like radiation which result in infertility. Next slide please. And almost done here. Uh, so at uh, Cleveland Clinic we did start a center for young onset colorectal center. We saw 183 patients last year mean age 42. Most of our patients having uh, the largest category, um, uh, well, sorry, rectal cancer was in 42% and stage four, 36%, which is more than what you see in the general population where it's about 25%. And we did make these referrals to the services mentioned. We also try to collect uh, enroll patients in the registry, collect blood, stool, tissue, so we can learn more about this entity and we're developing an epidemiological questionnaire. And these sorts of centers are developing multiple centers. We also put on educational events. And next slide, please. Um, these are my takeaways. So uh, young onset colorectal cancer, diagnosed in individuals younger than age 50, incidents increasing in the US and other high income countries around the world. Um, the largest category is occurring in patients ages 45 to 49. These are patients with predominantly left-sided and rectal cancer. Um, they're more likely to have metastatic disease at diagnosis. Uh, and, and where obesity and poor quality diet are the best characterized risk factors, but we see so many patients who are young and fit um, who don't fall into those categories. So we really don't know what's causing all of this. The red flag symptoms to look out for appear to be abdominal pain, rectal bleeding, diarrhea, iron deficiency anemia, and the impact on our patients, of course, cutting off their survival at such a young age, toxicities of treatment, and including time toxicity, financial toxicity, reduced quality of life. So um, any efforts we can make to diagnose these patients earlier when they're uh, more likely to be cured and avoid these toxic treatments uh, is so valuable. So I think with that, I'm stopping. And I thank you so much for this uh, opportunity. I think, Doug, uh, you're muted. There ain't no think to it, sir. I was absolutely muted. Thank you, Kush. Uh, thank you, Dr. Crystal Murphy. That was absolutely fascinating. And uh, there's a lot to unpack there. I, I, Chris, be prepared to go back to her last slide, not the thank you slide, but that last summary slide when we get all done with this. But with this, uh, since we're running a little short on time, I'm gonna go ahead and move on to our case presentation. And we have Dr. Kush Desai and also, uh, I wrote it down, so Aisha Viquez. Aisha. Yeah, Aisha from uh, Horizons. They're gonna do a case presentation that is titled just in the nick of time, case of the 50 year old, with colorectal cancer screening success. We'll turn it over to you, Kush and Aisha. Thank you. Yep, thank you, Doug. Um, so this patient, so um, 
as a background. Um, so this is a patient in one of our clinics in our region um, that I'm, I'm one of the medical directors for, for the CDC, for so kind of responsible for this clinic. And so I wasn't the provider taking care of the patient, but one of our providers um, that we work with uh, was, and I spoke to her today to get a lot of good details on this patient. Um, this is this is exactly the kind of patient that our program um, is targeted for, and, and, and this is the kind of impact that we have. So this is just one uh, one patient, but we, we hope to have a lots, lots, lots of patients as our increasing, uh, as we increase our screening rates. Um, and so this was a 50-year-old gentleman, a white male that came in um, for a routine follow-up. Um, this patient is typically not, um, doesn't come to all his appointments. He doesn't always take his medications, um, and is, 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 um, but fortunately did come to this particular appointment. Um, and so he was coming in for medication refill for his diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia. Um, had no particular complaints at this visit. Um, his review of systems were negative, no um, GI symptoms, rectal bleeding, weight loss, anything like that. Uh, next slide, please. And so objective data, um, so his vital signs, um, so his uh, weight was uh, as high as uh, 290. Um, and so his BMI was 41, so he is a B obese. Um, and his blood pressure um, was above his target. Um, and so it was 149 over 36, or sorry, 149 over 86. He did say that he hasn't been taking all of his uh, blood pressure medications consistently. Um, other than that, a physical exam um, was unremarkable. Uh, next slide, please. So his routine uh, laboratories and glucose was elevated. Again, he wasn't taking all of his, um, his diabetic uh, medications. Uh, he was supposed to be taking insulin and wasn't, um, had ran out of his, his medication. So that's actually why, one of the reasons he came into this particular routine appointment. Um, but other than that, unremarkable, um, no, um, uh, no anemia. I mean, his, his uh, white blood cells, everything were, were within normal limits. Um, next slide, please. Uh, past medical history, um, has, has uh, several chronic conditions um, that, I, that I discussed earlier. Uh, family history, no history of colon cancer. He didn't um, have uh, really any cancers. Um, did have a history of um, some heart disease. Uh, social history, he says he's never a smoker, um, although his wife smokes and he drinks socially. Um, his diet is um, not great, eats a lot of fast food and um, uh, processed foods and, and things of that nature. Um, so at this clinic or at this appointment, this was um, uh, one of the, our provider uh, astutely recognized that, you know, he came in for a hyperglycemia um, for his routine follow-up, but she recognized that also he was uh, due for screening. Um, being age 50, of course, the guidelines are now 45, but, but he when he turned, you know, when he was 45, the guidelines were not for him to get screened at that time. So, um, but she did notice that he needed to be screened. So she gave him um, an FOBT test or FOBT, or um, actually it was a fit kit. It wasn't the FOBT, it was a fit kit that we were, um, that we provided him. Um, and um, once we provide a fit kit to patients, they get referred to navigation. And so the navigators who, um, for this particular patient in this particular region is Aisha. Um, and, and so she kind of takes over um, making sure the patients um, get that fit kit back. And she's going to talk more about that in a, you know, a little bit later. Uh, so next slide, please. So uh, the fit kit um, was completed and returned, and it was positive. Um, so it was referred uh, by the navigator to a uh, general surgeon who does the colonoscopies. In this uh, rural community, there are no gastroenterologists, so it's the general surgeons that are doing the uh, colonoscopies. And so when he, and this was about a month later, and so when, when he came to his uh, general surgery appointment or his uh, colonoscopy appointment um, or the pre-op visit, um, he actually at this time, about a month later, did complain about red blood in the stool and had some diarrhea as well. Um, he also complained of some right upper quadrant pain, um, which he did not have complaints about previously. Um, denied any other GI symptom, no change in bowel habits, uh, no change in bowel habits constipation, uh, straining um, on physical exam, they, there were no masses, hemorrhoids, um, anything of that nature. Um, and so, um, and, um, and so he was positive for FOBT. And so of course he got the colonoscopy um, by this uh, endoscopist. Um, next slide, who's also a general surgeon. Um, so the colonoscopy report, they showed a, a, a transverse, uh, the distal transverse colon, there was a three centimeter polyp um, that was uh, concerning um, and the rest of the colon was normal um, or didn't really show anything else. So they, they did, he did a biopsy of that polyp uh, the biopsy showed adenocarcinoma, um, and so once that happened, Aisha was, so our um, colonoscopy report and the pathology reports are faxed to um, Aisha, our 
either faxed or she has access to the records. And so she immediately recognized that this patient has uh, cancer. And so she started reaching out to the patient and making sure they get to their, um, their follow-up appointment for the general surgeon. Um, so did she, the patient did get a um, colectomy um, by the same surgeon. It was a um, uh, partial colectomy. Um, and um, the report of the, the pathology report from that procedure showed adenocarcinoma, adenocarcinoma focally invasive to the submucosa. Um, and that was a considered stage one, um, negative for uh, lymphovascular invasion. Um, and so they, he did like a lymph node dissection of like 14 lymph nodes and they're all negative. Um, and so that, that, that's kind of what the path report showed. Uh, next slide, please. And so just as a, as a timeline, um, so it was pretty quick timeline. A lot of times it doesn't happen. And so within um, just two months, um, this patient got their fit kit and was diagnosed and was had a and, and received the um, curative procedure um, and had a follow-up appointment and is now considered cancer-free. And so this was all because of the navigation and, and the uh, services they provide in order to be able to do that within that time frame. And so um, just as, as a reminder, I mean, they got the, the fit kit. Um, on uh, in February, uh, February 17th, um, and then which was positive, it was returned within, um, you know, it was returned actually within a week, which is pretty rare. And actually our provider has also played a big role in this. Uh, she knows the patient well, um, and she told him that if you don't do this, um, you know, there's a good chance you're not gonna be around too long. If you don't get your, your, your screening stuff in, in line and start taking your insulin, um, there's a good chance that, that you're not gonna be around. And she, she just told him straight up, um, he did listen. Um, and so, you know, we got the fit kit back. Um, pretty soon after, within a month later, general surgery was consulted for the follow-up colonoscopy. Colonoscopy was gotten, uh, they got the colonoscopy about a month after that. Um, and this, uh, uh, I think it was either the same day or it might have been just a few days later, um, they did that colectomy. And so the general surgeon, because it was the same person that did the colonoscopy that, that does the, the procedure, that was also really quickly. Um, and they got the follow-up appointment um, and they were seen uh, recently, I think, uh, a few weeks ago was seen by our provider um, and is doing well. And so still his blood sugar was still high. So we got to work on that one, but um, at least um, we took his, uh, he was uh, cancer free. So um, didn't require any other uh, chemo or anything like that. Uh, next uh, slide. And so this is the role of navigation. And so Aisha is the patient navigator that was actually helped, that, that was uh, the one responsible for this patient. Um, so uh, next slide. So Aisha, if you can kind of just go, you don't have to go through these specific bullet points per se, but just kind of go through quickly, um, kind of um, what you were able to do and, and how you operate. Because I know a lot of times we order these tests and then we don't know what the navigators do um, as providers, but but you guys are doing a lot behind the scenes. So if you want to sure. comment on that, Aisha. Thank you so much. So basically this is a case of a successful navigation to completion. Of course, when the fit was initiated, dispersed at the clinic, it was referred immediately for navigation. We received it the same day and acted on the referral immediately by contacting the patient. Can everybody hear Aisha? Thank you. Okay. And um, when we didn't initially get him, we sent follow-up mail just to make sure that he completed the screening. The kit was returned in less than a week as he had mentioned. Um, once the result was in, we could immediately see that it was positive and he was gonna need follow-up care. Um, immediately contacted the provider to let him know that what the result was and um, for a patient notification and follow-up colonoscopy. And once that colonoscopy referral was made, then we made initial immediate contact with the patient so that we could go ahead and get them scheduled. And that encompasses working with other care teams, in this case, the surgeon's office to make sure that we could get them a consultation and then the corresponding colonoscopy. In this particular case, even though he was screened pretty quickly, he actually rescheduled the initial consultation. So we might have actually screened him and completed him sooner had that not occurred. So that's part of the critical piece of navigation is when we're following them all the way through, we're making sure that they come to every aspect of it. So as soon as he canceled the initial appointment, we were right back on the phone with him, getting him rescheduled and making sure that he completed that second appointment when we do the consultations also, we send them uh, reminder letters and phone calls to make sure that they get to the appointments upon completion. Once his actual colonoscopy was completed, was scheduled, excuse me, 
we went ahead and uh, sent him uh, his prep and his prep instructions, which a lot of times most people are not aware, but that is part of the navigation that we provide for them. Um, when they're prepping and a few days before the colonoscopy and the day prior to the colonoscopy, we're calling them, making sure that they're following, following their dietary, dietary guidelines and that they're completing the prep as indicated so that they can have a successful colonoscopy when they show up for their appointments and that they're clean, that they're staying hydrated enough because that could be a problem when they come. And then once the colonoscopy is completed, we're also calling them after to follow up, make sure what their experience was like, that they're feeling okay, that they're not having any issues. In this particular case, we were immediately, I was able to go in and see the report. I could immediately see that something wasn't quite right. Of course, can't um, verify that until the pathology was completed, but that prompted me to then identify gaps in care where we could then say, okay, so if the pathology confirms that this is a carcinoma, then what are we gonna do? So that prompted us to start talking to the other parts of the care team to go ahead and get his steps, his next steps in a row so we would know where to send him, what his options were, especially for insured patients, this is a little bit easier because they have options of where they can go for uninsured patients, that becomes really difficult just because they have no insurance and a lot of doctors don't have indigent programs. So in this particular case, an uninsured patient, you know, it, it prompted multiple phone calls to try and figure out where we could send them. Working with the um, surgeon who actually did the colonoscopy, he actually had his surgery for the removal of the carcinoma about three weeks after the initial colonoscopy. Um, but that took coordinating with the surgeon for the surgeon fees, coordinating with the hospital for the hospital indigent part to cover his screening, making sure he went back making sure he prepped for that next screening of the correctly and making sure that there were no other barriers to care. So it's a really critical piece to make sure if we had not done all of the behind the scenes stuff, the constant calling, the follow-up, all of those things to make sure that he closes the loop, this patient's case, had he not completed that screening, had he not come back for his consultation and follow-ups, he could have been telling a different story a year from now. Luckily, we found it early. He was cared for very quickly. We make sure that he went through the system all the way to the end. He, of course, expressed his gratitude in indicating how grateful he was for the program. And of course, not just the navigation piece and the, the CDC part that's helping pay for these, but also the surgeon himself and their care team and what a great combination of care he got all the way through, which is really something to be said because it, there are a lot of moving parts to this. It's not one person alone. Thank you, Aisha. Yeah, that's, yeah. So she, um, just like Aisha said, I mean, you know, just to highlight, I mean, the importance of the work they do. Um, we've all heard of patients that were missed uh, some point along this line uh, who then present much later. I mean, I see it. I, I work in hospitals. I see this um, more often than I would like to. These patients that are, um, you know, we, we'll show up on CT scans. It, it'll show up on rectal exams and um, other other ways. And so that's not the way you want to diagnose these um, these cancers. So. Um, all right, very good. So, uh, Doug, do you, uh, back to you. Do you want to go through some questions and stuff? Yeah, yeah let's do some um, question and answer here. First of all, thank you, Aisha and, and Kush, for, for that presentation. I'm, I'm smiling a little bit because we've heard from two of our expert navigators, one from the southwest today and one from the east part of the state earlier, and it's Aisha and Maisha. So, it's uh, it, for an old man like me, it's going to be a little bit hard to keep those names straight, but uh, but we appreciate you. Uh, we do have a question in the chat, and if um, Aaron Sweezy is still on, Aaron, if you'd like to ask that question out loud, I believe it would be directed to any of the presenters if you're there. If not, I can read it, but I think it'd be better if you could. Yeah, Mostly. I'm. Yeah, can you guys hear me okay? We can. Awesome. Uh, Aaron Swayze here with the Nebraska Colon Program. And um, I was wondering, um, with the FIT kits, are we seeing more, are they more sensitive in reporting than FOBTs? And are we seeing a high number confirmed colorectal cancer cases with colonoscopy follow-up to kind of confirm that the, uh, the test is valid? Dr. Christian Murphy, you want to take that first and then we'll turn it over to Bush or someone else who might have well, a response. 
I think I better defer since I'm not uh, the one, I'm not the screening um, expert. So yeah, F, yeah. Um, I don't know if I'm an expert, but but FOBT requires the three stool samples. Um, and so compliance was really low um, with, the, with the three. Um, it's also more false, false positive. Like if you eat certain like red meats and things, it'll be false positive for the FOBT. And so um, for that reason, um, the fit is, um, it's more specific because there's less false positives. Um, and, and so, and, and it's much, um, patient compliance is a lot higher because you can do it um, in one, um, just one exam in one um, sample. Um, and so that's kind of why we used uh, the fit over. Yeah, I think that was a, a typo in the slide, but we use the fit kits now. In fact, we've actually, you know, um, clinics that we've, tra uh, that we've switched over from FOBT to fit, uh, we've actually seen their, their screening numbers go up just because of that switch, because patient compliance goes up. Um, and so there was a clinic in Augusta several years ago that, that we helped them with that transition. Um, and so uh, I think some of the guidelines like still say FOBT is okay, um, but like um, the American College of Gastroenterology just has fit and colonoscopy as their tier one guidelines. They don't have anything else in there for that reason, so. I'm going to ask to see if Dr. Hox is where he can respond to that as well. If he heard the question, I saw he was on earlier, but he's back in his car. I thought he was out of the car. Dr. Hox, did you have something to contribute to that? You muted. If you're driving, forget it. I thought you were out of your car. <laughs> no. All right. We're going to move on uh, then. Um, let's, let's, are you stopped now? No, I think I'm unmuted now. Are you stopped? Um, no, I'm not. Okay, well then don't. I'm not going to be responsible. Okay. No. okay. <laughs> Sounds good. We'll come back to you. Cheryl, did you have something to, to contribute to that? I saw you turn on, so. No, I was actually going to ask another question if we could. Okay. Totally well, good, good time for that. I'm going to let you have it. All right, Dr. Krishnamurti, really good presentation, but so tell us, who do we need to raise awareness among? The primary care physicians to recognize these symptoms in younger folks? The patients themselves? Both? If you had to kind of, you know, if you had to choose one, who do you think we should really target to raise awareness about this issue? Oh, thank you. Um, well, I think I think it's always important for the, the we have to do a better job with uh, the patients because they have to know that they're at risk. I don't think that most young people even know that colorectal cancer is on the list of things that could cause them problems. And I think a, a patient who's informed and educated could then be empowered to speak up. Um, but certainly from what I'm, you know, the literature shows, the primary care physicians, I think um, maybe obstetricians as well. Uh, I, of course, we do recognize that many of our patients have no symptoms, because I do hear that from the patient advocates, because it's it's not just a matter of recognizing symptoms, because uh, people can be diagnosed with metastatic disease, and they they literally, for a long time, they had no symptoms. Um, but I guess if I had to pick one group, I'd start with the patients, and I don't know the best way to do that, because I'm a treater. I, you know, my work is in, like, chemotherapy uh, treatments of, of the cancer, but I think any creative ways to get, you know, Instagram influencers, uh, TikTokers to share this message and maybe some sort of a fun, engaging way to like get young people to like just to remove the stigma about talking about this it would be great. I, I, I'm going to just chime in one thing about that. And, you know, we spend a lot of time promoting amongst providers the screening criteria. And so, I think there's a tendency sometimes when we hear, well, the screening threshold is at this age or that age, whether it's you know, mammography or colorectal cancer screening, whatever it is. Um, so we kind of get locked into a mindset that says, well, you're too young for that because you're not at the screening age. And so we need to make sure that the providers are paying attention to the symptoms and actually willing to go deeper and justify it, even if it doesn't meet the screening criteria, because what we're seeing with these young onset cases is that their delay in diagnosis is significantly greater than the older patients because, and maybe it's just easier for the uh, for the providers to say, well, you're you're of age, so let's get let's get you screened, as opposed to you're too young for that, 
Um, let's, let's assume it's the common thing rather than something unusual. Any other thoughts uh, or questions about that? Surely we have some out there. Dr. Sheldon, you're leaning in. Did you have a question? I can't hear you, sir. We, we still can't hear you, Dr. Sheldon. I'm sorry. Yeah, you, you can put your uh, question in the chat, Dr. Sheldon, so we can... I'll answer it that way. As you're waiting for the question, I just have a comment about um, the education. Who do we target? So I think an opportunity is there, um, as Aisha talked about the whole crosses. At the very end, um, the, the patient is saved. Now he is a person who has a history, right? And so that person with the history, if that they're targeted with the messaging to let their family members know about that risk, that could be a way to do that because now they're hearing from somebody they know. And also um, as um, Dr. Krishna Muthi was talking about um, the cases, it's because they talked in the family. It's because of the family. So if that patient who was um, saved per se, um, and now they're no longer, they're free from cancer, they can be given the messaging to spread to their family. So their family is aware and they can ask questions to the providers when they go to see the providers. That could be one avenue. I think that's an excellent point. And I do see that in um, my patients that they do tell their friends and family about uh, colonoscopies and their story. And they're very interested in um, being, you know, we'd like to feature them for you know, educational um, materials uh, just to, raise awareness and uh, you know they're very interested in participating. So that's a great point that our survivors can be um, educators if they're interested. That's great. We have a question uh, from Teresa Williams, who's one a member of one of our treasured partners, uh, Three Rivers AHEC. Uh, Teresa, you had a comment and then you had a question. If you can, would you like to unmute and ask, please? Can't hear you. Well, I'll ask it for you then. So she was saying that it seems that a lot of primary care providers don't understand or are not familiar with the frequency for fit testing. Uh, and then what can be done to combat the lack of information on that? So Kush, that sounds like a good question for you as the director of the program. Yeah, so it's it's um, it's kind of resource intensive, but but it's things just like this, this echo. Um, and so these type of educational outreaches that we have, um, but but the things that happen with the echoes, I mean, I would say everybody on this call, I mean, I've seen the names many, many times. So you guys are probably already now aware, uh, not probably, definitely already aware of the guidelines. So I think it's going to require um, further outreach. And so everybody that's aware of the guidelines already on this call, I think should reach out to their um, their colleagues as well and, and, and their nurses and everybody to so we can kind of have a... Um, Kind of, kind of a echo effect. I mean, that's that's the whole purpose of this so-called Project Echo is to kind of spread the knowledge further than just um, the people that we're directly reaching. And so I think that's what it would require. Um, but what we do is we go into clinics. We um, that's one of my responsibilities to go to clinics and talk to providers and and re-educate. And so it just takes a lot of education. So thanks, Kush. Dr. Sheldon, I see your comment in the in the box. Um, and so I'll just pass that along unless you think you can open your mic now. I got you. Don't worry about it. Um, he was just making the comment that the presentation has been great, but it kind of points out to us that in the community health center world, there's this notion of collecting the measures and being able to measure our success and improve on that. But this is a very, these are very clear examples where we're actually impacting the lives of patients and not just meeting quality metrics. So thank you for that reminder, Dr. Sheldon. It's absolutely the truth. These are life-saving. It's when you see someone as, as a provider, when you when, when that first 26-year-old walks in with rectal cancer and it's advanced, as happened to me when I was a third-year surgery resident, you never forget it. And so you want to make sure that we're doing everything we can to pay attention uh, because these kind of uh, interventions do make a difference in people's lives. So um, any other questions? I'm looking around for raised hands or anything else. While you're thinking about that, I do want to 
point out that at least by my screen of the sign-in notes, uh, we've got people not only from all across Georgia participating from community health centers, from academic medical centers, from the area health education centers. We've got people from Missouri, North Dakota, Arkansas, Michigan, New Hampshire, and Kentucky. And I probably missed one or two out there somewhere, but this is a great afternoon. It's a great event. Um, if we could, uh, Chris, if you could, uh, Nebraska, thank you. Missed that one. If you, Chris, if you could roll back to Dr. Kristen Murphy's last slide, the one that was kind of that summary slide, I think that's going to be the wrap up slide for us here because these are the key takeaways. We don't want to forget, obviously, the lessons learned about the importance of navigation because it's the persistence and the relationship that the provider has with those patients that led to the referral to the navigator and then the navigator's expertise around the, the processes to get it done and also their passion for making sure that it happens. But if we go all the way back upstream, these are the key takeaways relative to the young onset issues. These are people under 50. It's a higher and higher incidence as each decade moves forward. While we do see an increase in the germline mutations in these populations, the younger they are, the vast majority of patients still don't just demonstrate a germline mutation. So these are uh, not necessarily inherited, although family history is still important. So we, it's paying attention to the symptoms, it seems to be the key here. So we need to make sure that patients know to, make, to share the symptoms, and we also need to respond to them when we hear this. Uh, we can't just assume that a woman uh, has iron deficiency anemia due to heavy menstrual periods. We've got to go further. We got to look further as one example in one of those stories. So, because here, back to, um, back to Dr. Sheldon's point, this is what happens if we don't. We have reduced survival. We have tox increased toxicities of more complex treatment. Uh, life-changing surgeries and uh, complications from uh, combined therapies and things like that, and overall reduced quality of life in someone who's starting in this journey um, very young. Dr. Kristen Murthy, I see you have your hand up. Oh, I just, I, I'm sorry, I know it's probably late, but I wanted to just say kudos for that case because it really struck me that you know, I know there's not a lot of time for these appointments, and then this patient came in with a glucose of 400, and yet the provider thought to get that fit test done and kudos to the patient with all sorts of things going on in his life. Within a few days, he did it and what a success. So that patient with stage one disease would never have to see someone like me or never have to experience chemotherapy or radiation. So that's just awesome. That's great. All right, so we're about at time. I'm gonna, I'm gonna wrap this up right now and I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Lorianne Oyambo to wrap us up today with the CME. Oh, hi. Can you hear me now? I, I can, Dr. Sheldon, real quick. Oh, good. I just wanted to tell everyone I thought it was a great presentation, and uh, um, I realized the work it takes in, in doing that, and just thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sheldon, for your participation. You're a faithful participant. Dr. Odiambo, wrap us up. Oh, yes. So thank you, Dr. Patton, for leading us through the presentations and the discussions. Um, thank you, Dr. Krishna Murthy, Dr. Desai, and Aisha Vaikus for your presentations. And thank you to all who offered comments and asked questions. They were very engaging. As you can see uh, on the slide, to claim CME and CNE credits at no cost to you, you can scan the QR code and we have an activity code with it. So just to take a few seconds to do that. And the link is also in the chat if you can access to the QR code. Okay. And then on the next slide, we have our end of year survey. So we really are uh, looking for your input and your feedback on how the echo sessions have been going. We've had 15 of them so far. And as we go into the next year, we're looking to make a few changes. So anything that you let us know um, will be helpful. And for completing the survey, you will have a chance to enter a drawing to win a $20 Amazon gift card. So think about how far that can take you. So the odds of winning are a little bit high, I would say, but um, just take some time to complete the survey. It takes about five or so minutes to complete.
Can you like tell please. us about the next session? Yes. So about the next session, because it's going to be 4th of July weekend, and that's when we typically have our sessions the first week, the first Wednesday of every month, we'll go ahead and have the, the session on the second Wednesday of the month, which so will be um, the 12th of July. Clarify, sorry, Lorian, uh, to clarify, the, the next session is going to be um, just for grantees. So the next actual ECHO session is going to be August um, for, for yes. the open end. So okay, so, okay, so that's all I, I wanted to say that we're going to use a different format and with the tele-echo sessions and we'll alternate between two, the, two of the formats and more details will be communicated at the end of this month. That way you can plan accordingly to know whether you're one of the ones to attend the next session or not. So as um, Krish said, we will have the next one in August. And the one in July 12th will only be the, the one for the uh, the ones in the clinic, right, Kush? Okay. Great. Thank you, Dr. Oriyama. Thank you to everyone who participated. We're one minute over, but we, we're going to count this as a victory because this was a lot to do today, a lot to cover. We thank everybody for being there. Uh, mm -hmm. Team members, stick around for just a few minutes for a debrief. Dr. Christian Murthy, if you have a couple minutes, you're welcome to join us for that. Uh, everyone else. We'll see you in August, and I see Iowa. I missed Iowa as well. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>